It's a great pleasure to wel welcome you all to the Palais today uh, for this interactive session on the theme of Planet 5050 by 2030, Step It Up for Gender Equality to mark this year's International Women's Day. As former UN uh, Secretary General Kofi Annan said, gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It is a precondition for meeting the challenge of reducing poverty, promoting sustainable development, and building good governance. And indeed, the goal of achieving gender equality and empowering all women and girls is now firmly anchored at the heart of the international agenda as the fifth of the 17 sustainable development goals that were approved by member states last September in New York. This is why in October 2015, the UN office at Geneva, the US uh, permanent mission in Geneva and women at the table co-launched the International Geneva Gender Champions Initiative. The initiative showcases the role of each of us in breaking down barriers by doing away with gender bias and stereotypes. And this is why we are here today to become conscious of our own bias in order to overcome it and to make great, greater strides towards gender equality. We have a very uh, interesting session ahead of us. And uh, therefore, without further ado, I just have to uh, give the floor to Ms. Tanya Odom, Harvard graduate global consultant. She's also a diversity uh, thought leader and writes for the Huffington Post and CNN. She'll be facilitating today's discussion. The way we're going to do it is that the first part will be dedicated to a candid dialogue with the champions sitting here, focusing on their own experiences. And in the second part, Ms. Odom will moderate an interactive discussion with all of you on unconscious bias. We look forward to your active participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We're here, you can talk back, like we're alive. So those who aren't here or who are on Periscope or Twitter aren't live, but this group of people are live. I shook hands with each of them, so I know it, right? I think um, one of the benefits of having people of this esteemed quality is to be able to see what we know is a good practice in getting leaders to really talk about diversity and inclusion and gender equality. This is a unique opportunity. And so, as was stated, it will be a dialogue. So I'll ask them some questions. We'll have a couple of opportunities for you to ask questions. And my first question to all of them, in addition to just thanking them for being here, is why is this important to you? So the topic um, that we're talking about is unconscious bias, which we know are sort of these implicit associations that we sometimes make these things that go beyond detection and actually could contradict our personal values. So I think that's an important piece. That's really a different topic that we might be talking about. So why is this important to all of you? Maybe I'll start our, on this way. Why is this topic important to you? Well, as you say, it's extremely important and it's critical to all that we do. First of all, by not achieving gender parity, and uh, we never quite arrive at that goal, I'm afraid, we're cutting ourselves off from a lot of uh, important ideas and catalytic efforts. We are wasting a lot of talent uh, who could be helping us to achieve our objectives. We basically lose credibility as an organization. Uh, we are uh, lacking, uh, we're taking a reputational risk. Uh, we're not representative and we're seen as such in the field, particularly where we're working uh, around the world. Uh, and I have to say on a confessional moment that uh, IOM has not achieved uh, gender parity that would have been hoped for and that I had expected. Uh, I'm disappointed in that. I'm disappointed in myself in that regard. Okay, we have overall globally with our 9,000 to 9,500 staff, we have roughly a 53-47 ratio now, which sounds very good and I wish it were. But if you go then to the senior levels, D4, P5, and D1, we don't go beyond D1, then it drops off to about 78, 22, with women falling off deeply uh, to, to, to in, in the, around 20%. As this shows you that we are not giving the opportunities. First place, we are not keeping up on the promotion side. 
And I will never forget that when I was brought back to Washington in my former career, I was brought back to Washington by the Undersecretary for Management to do something about the gender problem because the women had just taken the State Department to court and had won. Uh, they, had, they had won on lack of, promo lack of recruitment, promotion, uh, and assignment uh, equity. So they just lost. So I went back to try to do something about minorities in general, but women in particular. Uh, so in the end, if you don't do the right thing, you'll be forced to do the right thing. Uh, so we have to do more on that uh, to, to move forward. The only other point I guess I would make is that um, we, um, we and I made this point this morning when we had our session, we tend to treat female mediocrity much more harshly than male mediocrity. If, if you're a mediocre male, you probably get by with it for a whole career. If you're fem mediocre as a female, you're likely to sort of not advance very much. So I would make that point. And then uh, I, I failed in my part over the years for not spending more time counseling, mentoring, uh, trying to help develop uh, some of the women staff who were not excellent performers and probably all they needed was just a, a little help to be seen that they're appreciated in order to move forward. Um, and I guess the final thing I would say that I should have insisted much more with the UN Secretariat and DPKO to give me at least one woman uh, deputy SRSG when I was in the Congo. We had two ASGs, uh, uh, DSRSGs, and they were both male all the time. I could have done more there. Uh, I was fortunate when I was ambassador to have a deputy ambassador, a, a woman deputy ambassador in three of the six missions I headed, but uh, I could have done better, certainly in the UN. Sorry. Thank you. Ambassador. <clears throat> um, thank you. Um, I think that, um, to me, um, the question of gender equality or gender parity um, is important for two main reasons. Um, one is the, um, the issue around it's a basic human right, and I'm sure Kate's going to talk more about that um, when the, when the, the um, uh, floor is turned over to her. Um, and then, as um, Bill mentioned, there's the, the economic imperative to having women um, uh, adequately represented, equally represented as full members of society and contributing um, to their full potentials. And, you know, we've all seen the studies of how um, having more women in the workforce um, leads to greater um, creativity, um, greater productivity, greater profitability. Um, and how women are also much more inclined to invest their earnings back into their families and into education and healthcare for their kids and into their families' well-being. And so, you know, sort of all the benefits that, um, that we see that come down the road from that. Um, you know, in terms of unconscious bias, um, I think there's, to me, the, the two main drivers are how pervasive it is um, and how powerful um, unconscious bias is. And in terms of being pervasive, um, we all have unconscious bias. We, men, women, children, um, we're all shaped by our cultures, our families, our own um, personal experiences. Um, the media has a big role to play. And we, we form these default ways of thinking about things and, and patterns of how we categorize things. And then anything that doesn't fit into what we've sort of been hardwired to, to think is the right way, um, uh, you know, when that happens, then we kind of don't know what to do with that information, and it causes us to be very judgmental and very unaccepting <clears throat> of things that don't fit. So an example of um, you know, people think of men as leaders, providers, um, being driven, being decisive. And on the flip side, you know, sort of the women's um, default is you're emotional, you're caring, you're supportive, you're a great team player, um, you're compassionate. Um, and so a woman that is um, trying to advance 
um, or is in a, a field of study that's not considered um, male is judged more harshly and um, not supported. And these are um, often in ways that we don't even realize that we're, that we're doing. Um, uh, and these, these patterns and these beliefs are really um, developed and shaped in, in early childhood. And, and as I mentioned, the media has a big part of that, but so do parents and, and teachers and peers. So it's something that's very pervasive. It plays out in the workforce, in the classroom, um, you know, in our world, in, in panels and conferences and, and those types of discussions. Um, and um, so it's basically everywhere. So that's one reason why it's um, very important and that we all need to be um, mindful and, and address this. Um, and then um, secondly, it's, it's a very powerful phenomenon because the cumulative effect of, um, of unconscious bias is so great. Whereas, you know, for one individual in her lifetime as she's going through, you know, school, elementary school, secondary school, whatever, higher education, and then on into their career, um, these little biases and barriers and obstacles add up. And so, um, uh, you know, you can't underestimate that the cumulative effect is going to end up having a, a significant effect on individual women's um, careers and productivity and um, uh, feeling of self-worth or lack of confidence. Um, and then if you then take it in a more macro view and you think about collectively what that's doing mm -hmm. when um, all women and girls are being made to suffer the consequences of unconscious bias, I mean, the, the overall sort of global, global result is really astounding. So, um, so I would say that's sort of why it's important to me. You know, I've had my own experience um, with unconscious bias. I, I was thinking back, trying to get ready for this. One of my earliest memories was, at the time I didn't even think about it that way, but it was when I was in fifth grade and I went to a new school and I was originally just put into a regular math class. And after a few weeks, um, you know, math, I was pretty good at math and the teacher said, oh, you know, we're gonna move you to the accelerated math class. They didn't call it that, they called it the smart boys class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and at the time, because it was, it happened to be a group of boys and I, and I didn't really think that it was unconscious <laughs> bias playing out when I was 10 years old. Mm. But I remember thinking that I must have like a boy's brain. Mm. And like, why do I have a boy's brain, you know? Um, so it's, you know, it starts early. And then as I sort of progressed through my career, I, um, for whatever reason, picked a lot of male dominated um, fields. I was an engineer and then I went into um, um, some of the science, um, uh, uh, energy and telecommunications and some sciences and then ultimately investment banking. Um, and so I was always um, finding myself in situations of being, you know, the <coughs> assumed to be the spouse or assumed to be the assistant. And, you know, the things we all see those, those stories and there's some funny videos online that, um, that have flipped the the um, the roles and have the men showing a man showing up and and being um, automatically assumed that he's the spouse and he's going no but I work here um, so I it resonated with me because I've had that through my you know my entire career so um, there's a personal aspect of my concern about this as well mm, great thank you Director General Mallow why is this important to you it's important for several reasons it's important both at the personal level over the years um, and the experiences I've had, um, certainly professionally and, and personally, but let's just stick to the, prof the professional, have shown that um, it's better when there is greater diversity. Some of the best bosses I've had have been women. Some of the best staff I've had have been women. But particularly where there has been a balance in the makeup of the, the team in which I've been working with, it has been more productive, and it's been more pleasant to work in. So from a personal point of view, I've had so many examples across the years 
that it makes it uh, a sort of a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. On the um, on the sort of broader, which is actually more important than my personal likes and dislikes, um, let me start by uh, by using a quote from the uh, new Prime Minister of uh, Canada, who was asked uh, why his uh, new cabinet was so diverse, and his answer was because it's 2016. <laughs> and um, it's true, um, and it's true in many ways. It's particularly true because um, in the business that we work in um, and the world we live in, we are now in the process of undergoing a very deep uh, change in the way we're going to be managing our affairs, both at the international, the national, and the local level. Um, we're moving from um, very strict um, structures to something much more um, inclusive, multi-stakeholders, uh, where we need to bring in um, all sorts of new uh, voices around the decision-making table. And um, that cannot be done without uh, having everybody around that table. That means women as well, of course. Um, it's true in the field where I've worked many times, where most of the most successful um, programs that we implemented were only successful because women were involved, both in terms of peacemaking, but also in terms of development issues. Um, we have just given ourselves, the world has just given itself a whole series of, uh, of policy frameworks last year. 2015, I think, will go down in history as much more important than most of us think of it right now. But it will bring about, and it has bring brought about already, the need for a completely different way of working. Um, and it's uh, paramount to a deep culture change in structures, both national and international, um, where, again, it is not going to happen unless we have everybody on board. So um, it's a no-brainer, as I said before. It's absolutely essential. And that we do that, um, and that we change the bias around, mm -hmm. and make it a positive one. I've just been given a gift. I wasn't aware of this, but uh, Corinne, <laughs> who um, who keeps a beady eye on this, uh, just tells me that uh, first of all, in in Geneva here in uh, in UNOG, we are about the same as uh, as the as Bill's organization. We have about 48 percent overall, but again, uh, on the top it gets a little thinner. Uh, particularly if you look at the whole UN. If you look at the UN at D2 level, <coughs> it's about 27%. But it turns out that my bias has been turned around because I now have total parity between D1s and D2s that report for me. Oh. Uh, so that's good. So <laughs> it's something that we really need to work hard at. It's, uh, it's really, um, um, it's, 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 it's not a, a nice to have, it's a necessity, it's a must do. And we'll get there. Um, I'm a little worried when I see the figures uh, that uh, are being brought about from uh, the for Shield campaign and others that tell us that um, parity in the workforce was not going to happen until 2095. That simply doesn't make any sense. <laughs> um, and we just have to double, triple, quadruple our efforts to make sure that it happens. Okay. It's possible. Thank you. Happy High Commissioner, what do you, why is this important to you? Well, th thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to sit with these fantastic leaders and I really want to celebrate the, the occasion of International Women's Day and the gift of the conversation. Um, you know, to, if I may most humbly say, you know, gender parity matters because its alternative is unfair. Mm. It's just wrong. I mean, it's wasteful, it's inefficient, it's unimaginative. It's unintelligent, it's dumb, <laughs> it's stupid, it's wrong. So th that's the bottom line. The second thing though, and uh, well, let me just say, you know, how wasteful it is uh, in an age of uh, austerity, in a time of great scarcity, <laughs> how can it be that we use such a dumb category and we use a category so dumbly to deprive ourselves of the fullest talent of the greatest resource there is on the planet, the hope for the planet, which is the human resource. So that, that's the first thing that strikes me. The second thing that why I think the theme of uh, this year's International Women's Day is important and uh, gender parity is we are complicit in it. 
Now, this doesn't come from nowhere. It comes from agents of decision-making that create that system that rewards unevenly, unfairly, and unimaginatively, uncreatively, and stupidly. Did I say that before? <laughs> uh, women as compared to men. I think, uh, I was just trying to remember who it was, but I think it was, was it Juliet Mitchell who talk, spoke of the internal map of patriarchy? And, and for me, almost any power relies upon a complicity, joining us to the legitimation of the claim to power. And what, for me, is incredibly important, and of course, it's not just confined to gender, but the intersectionalities that cluster around gender. So it's also about race. It's also about indigeneity. It's also about ability, disability. But these, these clusterings of rigidities, you know, the boxed in, the boxed out, the boxed about, that, if, that is created through these narrow, mean-minded, unimaginative, depriving of talent categories, we're instrumental in that unless we make conscious the bias that we've been gifted with. And for me, the, the owning of your responsibility to deconstruct and stop constructing the other, because it's, it's not only about your own identity, and particularly as a woman, I, I think there is a journey of evolution there for your own esteem and your own sake, but it's also how you're complicit in creating another and the othering so that you are joined to this stratification that really is unsustainable. I mean, it's not cool. It's not okay. We can't afford it. Stop it now. Really, cut it out. Don't do that anymore. So we could all leave. <laughs> that was it. Stop it now. Just, um, just cut so, that So I know you had a comment. I just <laughs> wanted to say one thing on this, and, and this is connected to something you say. One of the things those of you who've been through my sessions know is that the unconscious bias is there, but it's the actions that actually perpetuate the bias. Right, so it's cutting people off in meetings, it's not giving people a voice, it's not putting people on panels. So for me, your examples are really important but because they show the severity, because I think people hear unconscious bias and think it's something woo-woo, right? Oh, this is a you know, flavor trend. We actually point to 40 years of research around how these micro behaviors that often come from unconscious bias impact people at the cumulative level which I think you both have mentioned. So you had a comment before my next question. Yes, uh, uh, in terms of uh, changing the culture, mm -hmm. of uh, being, sharing responsibility and changing it, just take a look at this room. 95% mm -hmm. or 97% of you in here are women. Why is that? Why is it that every time I take, place, uh, I take part in one of these meetings where we talk about gender, the vast majority of you are women? I mean, you kn you're already convinced. I don't really need to talk to, to, talk to people. <laughs> <laughs> well, so it, part of your responsibility is to convince your male, the males in your uh, environment, whether it's workforce or at home or wherever it is, to come along to these uh, talks. I mean, frankly, we really need to, uh, to proselytize here, otherwise we're not going to get there. So I have one question for each of you, and I'm mindful of your time. So Ambassador, I'd like to ask you a question, and it's really a question about, um, and you mentioned this a little bit, you were in fields where maybe you were one of few. Um, and, and that, you know, I would think that has a cumulative impact, and yet sometimes it helps people to also want to help other people. And you um, and Director General Mueller started the Geneva Gender Champion. So I'm just curious, when we talk about it, what was the um, thought behind it? In other words, what prompted you to be a part of that? Why did you want to be a part of that? Uh, well, I think... Um, uh, the way it came about was, uh, can be characterized by the Geneva, international Geneva community really coming together and um, uh, deciding um, through a lot of discussions that we, um, that we were um, having, um, trying to work together in different ways to address these you know, these long-standing issues that have, you know, we go decades um, with very little progress or uneven progress. And really the, the broader community um, engaging and saying, we need to do something about this. We need to um, 
push, our, push each other, push ourselves to try to problem solve in different ways. We need to partner. Um, we need to um, work together um, uh, and sort of break down, you know, people talk about breaking down silos. And in, you know, in some ways um, with the work that was being done on the SDGs um, and Beijing plus 20 and a lot of other factors, it seemed like sort of the time was right um, to really come together. And so what we did was, and you know, really the um, formation of this was a collaborative effort. It was um, uh, Michael and myself and Caitlin and really saying, you know, we, w these are issues that we can't solve all these issues alone. We have to work together, uh, men and women. Um, and so how can we put a structure in place here in Geneva that can be action oriented um, and that can really address um, and get at some of these issues like the unconscious bias. Um, you know, one of the, the primary components of the Geneva Gender Champions Network is this panel parity pledge. And um, we, we tried to shape it so that um, it wasn't overly prescriptive and um, uh, demanding parity tomorrow because we knew that wasn't gonna happen. But what was more important was to uh, put a process in place so that really everybody <coughs> that is involved in these, um, these events and, put, and organizing these discussions and these panels um, can be uh, encouraged, um, prodded into changing the way they're thinking about things. You know, why do you not have a woman um, that's on your suggested list of, of participants? Um, no longer accepting the uh, explanation that there aren't any qualified women, because of course there are. Um, so pushing back a little bit and really putting a process in place, um, which would then lead to, in a hopefully relatively short period of time, something closer to parity. Um, and you know, Michael and several of the other male champions have gone so far as to say, I won't participate on a panel that doesn't have at least one woman. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it was something that could be, be collaborative and action oriented. And I'll point out that, you know, right now I think we have um, approximately 60% of our gender champions are men. So it's been um, a really successful uh, uniting of this community around this important issue. And I just think the other two things quickly is, I like that it's, um, it, there's an inward focus to it. Like I was saying, you know, that there, there's a, a reflective process and, um, uh, you know, it's, it'll play out as people, it's helping to ch change attitudes, change these preconceived notions. Um, and then there's an outward focus where we're um, not only um, benefiting from hearing the diversity of views and more women's voices, um, but we're also, um, you know, helping these women be more visible and, um, uh, and, and giving them an opportunity and a platform to show how qualified and capable they really are. Mm -hmm. So the pledge, you should know, I've shared with private sector CEOs a lot, and it seems so simple, but I have to tell you how many of them have grasped onto this pledge as what a great idea, uh -huh. right? And I literally send them to your website, send them to the handout. I was in a meeting last week with a large global newspaper, and the CEO said to me, why didn't I think of that? And I was like, because they did in Geneva. I'm not sure what to say, right? But I, but I want to ask you a question about this. So you, as, as part of it, and we heard your thoughts about, one, your motivation, but two, and this actually happened to me last week in Vienna with a couple of entities, there's some pushback sometimes and some questions that says that if you're pushing for parity, that in essence, what's the risk? You may be running the risk of replacing women, replacing men with sort of not qualified women. So, so what, have you come across that and what's been your response to that? Um, no, I haven't come across that yet. <laughs> you will. I'm sure. They told me versus <laughs> you, so maybe it will be in the future. But what do you think about that? But the, the, uh, the, the answer is, uh, is rather simple as far as I'm concerned. And I could, we can bring it back to the discussion of the next Secretary General, for example. But uh, the fact is that this is not either or. Yeah. This is about getting the best person. 
or a given job, and whether that person is uh, female or male is secondary. Of course we need to push for, for parity, and but uh, that means that we have to be much better at, an, at first of all, going out there and, uh, and, and making sure that, uh, uh, that there's equal access to these jobs and that people know about them and that the way that we assess them, analyze them, interview them, and that the process is mm -hmm. fair and evens the, the playing field for everybody. But the fact is that you know, and access and opportunity mm -hmm. needs to be, uh, those are the things that need to be opened up. Um, I'm not here to replace men, I'm here to make sure that the best possible person is going to be working in this organization so that we can deliver on the mandates that we've been given. Mm -hmm. Now as to why I joined Pamela in this is very simple, because I was tired of the talk mm -hmm. and, um, and there was no action. And here we came up with something really easily understood, practical, measurable, something we can hold people accountable to, and, uh, and, 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 and it works. You know, from the day that um, I announced that I was no longer going on panels where there's no women, there are no panels without women, <laughs> basically. <laughs> the last one I had to really hit over the head was the Vatican, a bastion of male dominance, if there were ever was one. And um, within 24 hours, there were lots of women on the panel, all of them just as good, if not better, than the men who were on it. So. That to me was the, 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 the clincher. With small, simple um, uh, interventions, uh, practical interventions that make sense to everybody, you actually get things moving and we're getting things moving in less than, I don't even know how many months, a couple of months, we have over a hundred of them. We're now looking at how to scale that up into other duty stations. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I'm, I'm really happy to hear what you just said because um, clearly uh, we also have to do it with, uh, with, uh, with businesses. Tomorrow I'm going for dinner with uh, the IOC, another bastion of male, maleness, and I'm going to push Mr. Bach very hard to oh, nice. become a partner. Mm. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Director General, um, migration is an issue on everyone's minds. It's on television, we're all thinking about it, um, talking about it, and, and we look sometimes through the lens at women and women migrants. So can you talk a little bit about um, how this is related to that topic and the work that you do, and what are some of the biases that might be harmful about them or to them? Good point. Let me, let me just uh, pick up sure. one point that, that uh, Michael and Pamela were both making. Um, let me, oh, by just by way of levity, I was in New York last week and to moderate a panel and I thank the ambassador of Zambia and the ambassador of the Philippines for being there because otherwise I said I wouldn't have been able to take part. They were the only two women on the panel. <laughs> and sure, as soon as I finished the next panel it was all male, but anyway. Uh, I, what I like about the gender champions is it's very practical and I just wanna make the point that gender parity will not happen naturally. The males will make sure it doesn't. So if you don't have a policy if you don't have targets that are measurable, if you don't review it at regular intervals, then it just won't happen. And this is why I think what you all are doing is terrific, and I'm really pr proud to be part of that. On the, on the uh, question of migration, it is true that um, about 50% of all migration is, uh, is women. Uh, the character of the migration has changed significantly over the years. It's no longer just women going to join the family. It's increasingly uh, professional women pursuing careers, fleeing violence and all of that. It's true they're much more vulnerable along the migratory path. The whole problem of, of sexual exploitation and sexual abuse, uh, vi uh, uh, violence against them is much greater. But we, we should also make sure therefore that we have the right policies in place to protect them there. I'm very concerned right now the humanitarian crisis that has developed along the migratory paths in, into Europe. Um, women are also contributing enormously uh, through migration to all of our societies. Most of our countries were built uh, with the brains and talent of migrants, including in particular women. So I think that's the main thing I can say about it. We shouldn't just immediately think of them though just as victims, think of them also as, uh, 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 as pioneers because they are bringing ideas and, and new ways of thinking that will enrich all of our societies. They bring in a dynamism that we of course in the US know 
very well. Thank you. Deputy High Commissioner, can you talk to us about, and you said you started to talk about this, I think, but just why is this a human rights issue? I mean, how do you connect this to human rights? I, I think that you know, the foundational premise of rights, of course, is that we're all born equal and that anything that builds on the foundation of that equality that emerges as diversity and talent is to be celebrated. But anything that erodes that foundation of being, under, uh, being equal under the skin is to really be questioned. And uh, you know, in that sense, the con social construction of gender has become a confinement rather than a, a source of empowerment. Gender, in a way, emerges as performance, as theatre. You put on the accoutrement you know, of your gender. You wear a dress as, oppo as opposed to trousers. You dress dolls as opposed to dig in the ground. I mean, these are artifacts or artificial constructs of gender that has nothing at all to do with our individual uniqueness or the solid platform that we hold in common. And of course that, that discriminatory idea of what's acceptable for one group of people as compared to another is not uniquely attached to gender. It, it is a perversion of human capability that chases race and it chases sexual orientation and it chases disability. And in each instance, it creates a stratification that's completely counters to the basic ideas of human rights. An idea that somehow my identity versus yours is either superior or of greater value. But, I mean, the cherry picking that's associated with that differentiation of identity is a perversion of the basic principle principles of human rights. And I, I, I think it's something that is so profoundly unjust and so profoundly wasteful that in fact we should be deeply disturbed by our tolerance of it. Why, why on earth are we so tolerant of it? Why does it pass almost unremarked? Why is it not problematized deeply? If you think about the sustainable development agenda, actually, it says we've got to start with those left further behind. How on earth are we going to do that if we disguise exclusion, marginalisation, bigotry and discrimination behind highly to tolerated, very problematic, but somehow normalised categorisation of peoples? I mean, this we will never, ever realize the full potential of human beings so long as we disguise and distort the full capability of human beings behind these redundant ideas of where, where, how one should fit in. So to me, it's a deeply ethical problem. It's a deeply immoral problem. It's plain illegal under human rights law, but, it, but it's uh, eroding our access to human capability and that's unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's human rights business. Thank you. So before we bring Caitlin up, I'm, and the time goes so quickly, yeah? um, if possible, and I appreciate you all have started to do this, if you can end with something that everybody in the room could do, if, and I'll just give you a, like 30 seconds, maybe less because I'm getting looks from people, because so just what, what could people do? I think this piece about the practicalness of the parity pledge is really something to, to think about. And as someone who's been doing this work a long time, I think we often thought that people would figure it out, right? Let me give you the education and somehow you would be able to make, to problematize this, to use your language. And we, we haven't found that. People need guidance, people need help. So any one of you to start, what would you say is something that people in the audience could do as we sort of sum this up? Um, I have a couple of ideas. I think um, the first would be to, um, well, there's sort of general awareness raising, which, you know, we all, of course, expect you're going to do. Um, but I would add to that um, to look for ways to, to consciously filter women in mm -hmm. um, as opposed to unconsciously filtering women out. So just be much more mindful um, as you go through your daily lives, your, you know, your, your days at, at, on, in the office, and really um, try to 
um, um, be proactive about it um, and, and look for those opportunities because um, I forget somebody just said you know it's, this isn't going to solve itself we really need to take action mm -hmm. um, so that would be one and then um, the other thing would be to look for some ways to change systems because their systems are definitely set up to um, to fit with these stereotypes and unconscious um, bias um, biases. Um, one example, um, I was talking um, at the World Economic Forum annual meeting, there was a senior executive um, of a corporation and she said that whenever senior management positions become vacant and they basically post the vacancy notice and um, she gets a long line of men at the door um, and no women. Uh, or very few women, and she knows that there are women that are as qualified, better qualified than um, some of the men that are basically raising their hand um, and saying that they're, um, uh, you know, they're, I'm the one for you. And there's been studies that, of course, show this, that, you know, a man, um, I think the statistics are that um, as long as he feels that he's sort of 60 percent qualified, he's all in, <laughs> and I'm, I'm your man. <laughs> And, but a woman to put, to raise her hand and to, to self-promote needs to be, you know, 100, 110% sure that she can do the job. Um, and some women have a hard time, you know, that's what makes them uncomfortable, you know, generalizing, but it's just, um, it's harder. And um, so maybe the system that relies on, um, you know, people voluntarily promoting themselves and, and putting themselves forward for promotions isn't the right system. Maybe there should be a different system in place. So look for those types of opportunities where we can tweak or change systems so that they um, can basically adjust for these unconscious biases that we all have. Great. Anybody else? John? Well, let me piggyback on what Kate said, which I think is very true. I think that um, we all need to be educators. We have to talk about it. We have to confront our own biases, whether we are women or men, and really have it as part of our daily conversations with those around us. Mm -hmm. It's a major culture change that we're looking at. It's been one that has, has been there slowly. And it's particularly important in a, in, a, in, a, in a place like the United Nations, where you have 193 or, or more different cultures, a very asymmetric picture of where the issue of gender is. I'm from Denmark, uh, you know, our society is maybe a little bit more uh, gender sensitive, if you want, and has been for many decades uh, than another. So we talk differently, but th the fundamental of what you say has to stay the same. And I think that um, that conversation is not taking place enough around the coffee uh, mm -hmm. cooler, water cooler, whatever, or at lunch, etc. Because as you say, we accept it. Mm -hmm. All of us, uh, it's too easy to accept because it's part of our daily lives. It's part of the way we were brought up. It's part of our culture. It's part of the, of the, of the culture. It's, you know, these stereotypes are being reproduced in movies and music and all over the place. It's not as if we're in some sort of bubble here. Um, so it's really a very conscious, hard work effort to educate each other and ourselves uh, on a constant basis that this has to change and then eventually we'll get there. But we just need to speed up this process because it's now that we need it. Mm -hmm. It's not in, 90, in 2095, trust me. Wonderful. Is that being general, I think? A little bit along the same line as uh, Michael. I think that we have to multiply our voice on this by reaching out uh, to as many people as possible making sure we bring a gender element into all of our conversations. Secondly, I think we need to follow the gender champion's lead and come up with some very practical things. I mean, for example, I began the practice some time ago that if I get a list, a short list for a position, and if there's not a woman on there, I send it back and I say, is there not one qualified woman in this whole organization who could do this job? I got this because uh, when I was the secretary for the amb ambassadorial appointments in the State Department, the deputy secretary told me, said, Bill, he said, don't ever send me a list here that doesn't have at least one woman on here. And I think that's the way you've got to make it happen. And, and if we can do practical things like that, 
I think we'll make some progress, not enough, but at least a beginning. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, thank you. Deputy High Commissioner, what would you say people can do? Um, I, you know, I, I think we're hearing and seeing examples right here today, three great leaders t making it personal. And I think we have to make it personal. Uh, if we're to subvert a system that is very resistant to change, then we all have to consciously step away from it and uh, call it for what it is. It is a, a system that has dominance built into it in a manner that uh, doesn't enable human creativity. I think the second thing is we have to predict that it is resi a resilient system and it will kick back so that it's intriguing that to merit is suddenly comes into the picture when a woman is asked, when uh, gender parity is sought in recruitment uh, processes, when quite clearly if recruitment processes have tipped out only men, and in particular white-skinned men, the merit has had very little to do with it for some time. But you have to keep subverting what the dominant narrative gives you, which then comes to a third point. I think you have to own your own standpoint. You have to own your privilege. And each of us has to live inside the skin of our own identity. Identity is not just in the other, it's our own. I might be a woman for all intents and purposes, but you know, I'm also white, I'm also privileged, I'm also um, without dis immediate apparent disability. I mean, these things matter enormously, that I understand the privilege in, of my position, but my identity as well and that I then think about how to dismantle that where it's unfair and unjust. And I make it personal. And this time, let's make it personal. And let's make it a deeply personal project that we will not be made complicit with a system that we know is inherently wrong. That's how it will change. Thank you. So we're gonna invite Caitlin up, but before we do, I'd love to just thank all of you and just give them a round of applause if we can, because it's... <laughs> Because I think that um, one of the things we know is that you do have to look at culture, right? We do have to look at culture and people who um, want things to change, but we have to look at systems and, and accountability as well. So um, I'm now going to um, turn it over to Caitlin Craft Buckman, who's the ED, the executive director and founder of Women at the Table to do a short summary sort of as we end this piece. Okay, great. That's, that works too. <laughs> okay. So thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Won't need this anymore. So there's you? a little bit of a, this is called, it's not really intermission, but what it is is that we have our guests that are going to leave the stage and I'm going to come down and start the unconscious bias short presentation to give us a little more um, of an idea about what we're actually talking about. So let me just come down this way and let you all be able to get off the stage. So many of you have seen this presentation. We've been doing this for almost a year at this point. I was brought in by UN Women initially to work with the UN Swap, which as many of you know is a very unique way to also keep us all accountable across the UN system. And one of the things we know, um, if we can just pull up that other presentation, that would be great. Yep. Let's put it in presentation mode, that would be great. Yeah, perfect. So one of the things we know and, and, and is that we sometimes see things and we don't necessarily always name them. I love this example of sort of naming things and naming things when in fact they're a problem. So I often begin with this slide, which may be hard to see, but it's a slide of this beautiful balcony. Anybody know where this is except for the people who've been through my session? What do we think? Where might this be? Italy, I don't have a lot of time, so I have to go quickly. It's Italy, and this was actually a seven-day court of private sector client retreat. This is in Taramina. And many of you know, Ron Heifetz is a prof business school professor who does a lot of work on leadership, and he says that we have to actually get on the balcony, right? We have to look at things, and we have to sort of get a perspective other than what we normally see. That's why I think this panel was so amazing. 
right? To have leaders at this level. Here's my perspective. Here's what I'm doing. So how many times do you think I went on that um, balcony? Come on, you, some of you have been on mission. Once to take the photo, right? And then maybe one other time as I sort of looked at it. And I'd love for you to think about this unconscious bias as a way to think about getting on the balcony. We know from the research, a lot of research, that diverse teams actually outperform homogenous teams. That's not new, that's research that we've had for quite some time. The interesting thing that many people don't focus on is it's not going to just happen. This is where accountability comes in, this is where metrics come in, meaning this last piece um, from Scott Page's research, but also from research that we have for years, shows us, in fact, that you have to it help people with the skill set. That, that's what Director General was talking about, those, that, that practicality. What are the skills that people need in order to manage and lead diverse teams? So unconscious bias as a concept, we've seen a lot more of its popularity in the last three to five years. However, a lot of the seminal research on unconscious bias in the workplace actually started in the 1990s, and I'll talk about that. We get 11 million pieces of information coming at us from any, at any one particular point. How many pieces of information can our brain process? Okay, the people who were already in my session are saying the answer, so we're not gonna listen to them. The answer is 40, four zero. So what happens to all of those other pieces of information? This is before wine, right? So that's on a good day in the morning as I start my day, 11 million pieces, 40. My brain creates shortcuts. My brain creates tricks and ways to in fact remember things to in fact help me get through the day. And what we know a byproduct of that is unconscious bias. So the definitions, a couple of them, as you'll see up here, and I'll read them out, it might be hard in the back. I'm not gonna read every single bullet point, but the one thing is important, they operate beyond our control, right? They're beyond our control. They're also implicit associations or characteristics. So I get off the plane in, in Geneva and I say, oh, the Swiss. You see a New York woman in front of you who speaks quickly, wears all black, and you say, oh, those New Yorkers, right? So, so we do this. And then the thing that's important is that it comes from our experiences, our exposure. The ambassador's description about that story. Imagine smart boys class. Imagine just thinking about the message of the girls who never made it there. And by the way, to think about, I sort of love this, and it's not revenge, but how many years later, the fact that she's an ambassador from the Smart Boys class, I love that. Can you think about, that's a book. 